That's why it's not. Yeah, welcome to the GIST seminar. So we have a new fancy system uh, uh, today. Okay, so uh, experimenting with it for the first time. So yeah, welcome to the GIST seminar. It's a pleasure to have Joseph today. So he's, uh, uh, most of you know Joseph already. He's uh, joined Glasgow as an undergraduate uh, in computer science in 2014 and then studied his PhD in 2018. And uh, uh, now he's a lecturer with us uh, working in XR and lots of exciting things. So uh, he'll be telling us how his research has developed uh, uh, after his PhD. So looking forward to your talk, Joseph. Thank you. Um, 10 years as a student slash staff as of September, which is terrifying. Um, so I'm aiming for about 40 minutes. Um, I'll start timer on my phone so I keep a relative track of time. Um, might be slightly longer because I didn't like the original ending. I thought it was boring. And then I tried to write a better ending, which made it a bit longer. But it's very strange. And when picking between a boring ending and a strange one, I picked the strange one. Um, because maybe it will be a bit more interesting. Um, so the talk, as you can see, is entitled Some Potential Harms of Everyday XR and How We Might Prevent Them. What does it contain? So to learn. Next. Is it frozen? There we go. Uh, what does it contain? Uh, some things I've done, some things I'm doing, some things I'm interested in, and some things I don't know. I include the latter two because that's why it's interesting to me, uh, why I plan to do some work on this in the coming year. Um, and to give you a flavor of things I've done and things that are going on, you know, just things like that. Um, what is it about? Well, in many ways, it's in the spirit of the new year, saying that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Um, and what does that mean for the current state of XR? Um, because it's very easy to get caught up in the hype of XR is really fun and cool as a new technology. But we've been here before, right? We think about, about Google Glass and maybe why that failed um, as a proto XR uh, headset, a uh, wearable form factor. And we're getting to the point where good everyday wearable XR arguably might soon be upon us. Um, Meta have their project ARIA uh, thing, which, you know, if they can obviously throw enough money at it to get good wearable headsets out into the market, it might be infused with AI given their current uh, trends. But I think you could see a visual AI, AR kind of headset device from them in the near future. If we look at the, the current state of optics, this was taken from a trade show last year, and we can see that these devices are a little cumbersome still, but it does a pretty good job of translating that real world scene into some sort of cyberpunk bar. And I think it's important to be mindful of the fact of how do we stop this perception being the glass hole from happening again. Uh, just at the end of last year, October 2023, um, The Verge posted their own uh, take, saying that the meta glass holes have arrived because people were using their MetaQuest 3s out, uh, well, at cafes and such. Uh, so you can see there, and I think it's important to be mindful of this because, again, there was a lot of social stigma around this initial first draft, arguably, of an AR device, um, and then to reflect on maybe where it went wrong. Um, and my starting point from this is from a PhD, and I was looking at how interactions occur between people who wear a VR headset and who don't, right, they're this non-XR person. Um, I'd like to call this a perceptual difference, right? But that's already a thing. That's if we're looking at the same stimuli, you know, do we perceive it differently? Um, so maybe it's a differing sensecape or a perceptual disparity, this idea that we're looking at the same thing, but maybe our realities are being augmented in different ways. Um, and I'll talk about one quick result from some work I did in my PhD. Um, many of you have probably seen it before on surveying in the wild interactions between people who are using headsets and people who aren't. Um, in short, it was a story survey kind of thing where we were getting actual accounts and experiences people had had interacting with VR users or uh, non-VR persons as a VR user. And we had a process where we were capturing lots of information about these experiences that we then thematically analyzed. And these are very unbiased, unfiltered accounts of in the wild experiences. Uh, there's one result of interest I want to mention today. And that's uh, that one person uh, or one participant described having sex with their partner while wearing a VR headset. Uh, they got down on top, uh, the avatar in the right place, you could kind of get the idea there. Um, and if you Google around, you can find similar stories and discussions of this online, uh, which is a very out there uh, thing to do, but people are doing it. And 
it's very easy to make jokes about that. But I think there's a lot of potential for harm here as well, if you spend some time thinking about it. Um, because you have a very intimate context and interaction. It's very reliant on trust. And it's easy to imagine scenarios where that trust is exploited in some way to facilitate an unhealthy sexual uh, relationship or something. Um, simply put, you know, one partner could mislead the other about how they're being augmented. Um, the way that these XR devices are set up, you know, it's entirely optional if I show you the casted view. Even if I show it to you, what's to say it's the actual casted view? Maybe I'm lying. And, and it's very difficult to peek and see what I'm seeing in this XR view. You know, with a phone, you can just look over my shoulder. Same for a laptop, but with a headset, maybe you put it on and it doesn't do the thing that it does when I put it on because it's not the right context. And if we think about how this person could augment their partner, you know, maybe it's some consensual idealized version of each other that they've agreed upon, uh, but maybe they switch them out without them realizing it and it becomes somebody else, right? It becomes an ex-partner, a friend, a sibling, maybe it's even a child. Um, and all of that can happen without that other person's consent, maybe without their awareness of it. Um, how does a person feel at being unwittingly reduced to that sort of proxy placeholder to enable that to happen? Um, I don't know, it's one potential harm which came up uh, in our work. Um, what I'll say there. And I like thinking bigger picture. Um, I like having lots of examples of that to just draw from in case I need to reference them or throw them up in a conversation. Uh, so I spoke to Mark and we did a bit of a shared interest in this and that eventually became our uh, Inwit paper entitled Privacy Enhancing Technology and Everyday Augmented Reality, Understanding Bystanders' Various Needs for Awareness and Consent. And as we were in the Ruby Comp last year, um, I'm going to run you through some of the, the key results that we had there. That's, that's the, the title page for this part of the talk. Um, I won't talk about all of it. I'll be a bit selective just because the paper exists and so do Mark and I. Um, but I'll give you a sense of the lit review, right, which there was two parts of that. We were looking at the risk exposed to bystanders. Um, if everyday AR becomes this ubiquitous thing, uh, existing strategies to mitigate against a lot of these risks. And then a survey we did looking at sort of consumer awareness and concern, some insight into how we can maybe prevent harm with this idea of maybe consent as a factor. How do we bring back consent in this sort of ubiquitous AR world, which we might live in? Um, and it's framed from the perspective of Maybe one day we'll all be wearing these AR devices, right? I think you can make an argument that they have a utility to the point where maybe it becomes the next smartphone. Um, and then from that sort of perspective, when you take a step back, what are the risks posed to individuals, to bystanders, to other AR users, etc.? Yeah. Because when we do our lit review, we see what's going on with these devices. We find that they've been jam-packed full of more and more sensing. Um, it's not just optical and audio sensing, which, you know, in itself is very powerful. You can also do things like you know physical motions and body tracking and brain activity, etc. And all these are arguably requisite, depending on what you want to do with the device. You know, you need it for the device to function. And what else we find is that a little bit of visual and auditory sensing and some processing power go a really long way. So we can see a massive, you know, list of all these different cool and interesting things. Uh, that these devices can do just with a little bit of sensing and a little bit of processing power. Um, and all of these are really good. All of these can be used for harm uh, as well, which is the, the flip side and the, the double-edged sword of all this. Um, and again, we're back to the scenario of, you know, this is what you look like when you're using it for good. Uh, this is what you're actually doing, right? You've got this device that you're wearing, which is just pointing cameras and microphones and all sorts of different sensing technologies to the world around you. Um, this is sort of double-edged sword of a lot of this, this work and yeah, this thing, right? The, the same technology which is used for good is arguably used to enable the risks and harm. And you see that with lots of new technologies, right? The, the smartphone comes out, it has really good cameras. People start using it to take unconsensual pictures of people in sexual-like places, right? Creep shots, things like that. So it's this constant sort of back and forth with, with new technology. Um, to just talk about some examples of existing arms because that's always fun. Um, we'll start with the, the obvious one, maybe the, the augmented appearance. Uh, Julie, a student who worked with us over the summer, spoke about some of her work on this previously. And you know, we looked at it as well, right? In this sort of lip review, this idea that okay, we've got filters, we're going to use that to express our identity or fashion in some way. What's to stop me, you know, putting my own augmentations on everybody that I meet, everybody that I see? Um, you know, what if I made everybody wear a Trump cap? What if I decided priests should look like devils? You know, 
There's lots of weird things you can do there. You could take it further. And maybe you don't want to see people of a particular gender or demographic. You just censor them out of reality. You know, what right do you have as, a, have as an individual to do that? Does a platform holder really want to be associated with the device that enables that? Um, I think there's lots of open questions there. Um, I don't think there's good answers if the tech gets released um, and it can do it, and they don't really have a, a good uh, counter argument as to why it can do it. It's not just about projection, it can also be about capture. Um, I see plenty of examples of people just taking pictures of you know, statues and then having AR models to those to use. Um, you can do that for people too, arguably, uh, some sort of volumetric capture. Um, and then it becomes a question of, well, why would you follow that by default? Why doesn't my face look you know, blurred in some way? And you can just take my appearance, put it in some sort of you know, theater of your own device in VR or augment it onto people that you use in real life. Um, it just becomes a question of, you know, is it more invasive than taking my picture without my consent using a, a smartphone? Feels like it, or at least to be at best. Um, and it's probably worth thinking about why we want to use this in the first place. Um, as humans, we're very limited biologically, we're just spongy husks of flesh in many ways. Um, and AR, you know, it will selectively allow us to enhance our capabilities in various different ways, right? We can get super hearing and super sight, or we can have selective hearing, and that's very useful. But then we can also use it to eavesdrop, to spy on people without the consent. Um, we come back to this adage of being great power and that requiring great responsibility. So that's some of the harms. Um, there's plenty more, certainly. But, um, I think it's worth reflecting on the protections as well. Um, so that's what we were looking for in a review anyway. And there's quite a lot. Um, I think there's a decent setup for protections generally. It's just maybe a question of they aren't really taking, uh, they aren't really using them effectively um, there. Um, the one that a lot of people argue about is legislation. Some will say we've got too much to regulate this. Some will say we've got plenty already. Um, uh, we don't need any more. Others say we need more. Um, my point on legislation is it's very slow to figure out what exactly it's going to be to, to protect people. Um, just last year, they published, I think, legislation on uh, creep shots in Northern Ireland, trying to clarify some stuff there, arguably about, what, 20 years after you've been able to do that kind of thing. Um, it's also very reactive rather than being proactive. Um, it serves to you know, penalize harmful actions rather than deter them. So it's deterrence through... Uh, the threat rather than you know, prevention through some sort of litigation strategy. <laughs> We've got social norms as well. Again, arguably these haven't come out yet. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe they can be wrong, right? It's very easy for users to get the wrong idea about a technology, go wild about it online, and then suddenly you've got the wrong perceptions about your device or your product. Uh, community guidelines. There are some. There's an organization there. But when you see the number of people complaining that we're talking about talking on panels about AI ethics or explainable AI. It's very different than XR, right? It's very quieted, it's very pocketed. Um, certainly when I go to conferences and I talk about things like this, I get at least one person coming up afterwards saying, you know, yeah, that's probably a good idea that we have some sort of at least discussion amongst ourselves. In terms of prevention, we have things like privacy enhancing technologies. Um, many, many prototypes like this thing you see, uh, you look at the literature, um, most of them just work by cutting off all access to the sensor, maybe somewhat contextually. Um, the problem there, is arguably you're cutting out the potential for good and the harm at the same time. It's not really you know, doing it in a way which protects people, but also allows for use at the same time. Um, and then finally, there's privacy by design. So if you watch a, a press conference about XR or something, they will probably say the phrase privacy by design. And if you want to be rather cynical about it, you will say, how can you design uh, with privacy in mind when you don't yet know what the baseline levels of it are? Um, you don't know what a baseline level of perceptual agency is, for example. Um, and again, that's not to say that we need new things. I think all of these work um, as the sum whole. It's more just, if someone was to come to me with a list of, here's all the potential harms of AR, and how do you propose we protect it? You, know, you can hand wave your way through that, but that's not very convincing. And then maybe people sort of reject the technology and get back to the, the social norms, getting the wrong impression again. At least those are my thoughts. Uh, I'll quickly go through the survey that was attached to that EBCOMP paper. No, because it's very relevant. 
I'm just looking more at concern on potential for harm of this ubiquitous everyday AR from a sort of consumer standpoint. Um, and I had two main goals. One was looking at a sort of snapshot of current existing uh, you know, awareness of the tech. Um, and then the second part was looking at this idea of maybe we can design these things with privacy in mind. If we're all connected in some way via these ubiquitous devices, is there some sort of you know digital rope we can throw each other that we can manage consent and preferences by default? Uh, be it based on social relationship, right? So if I maybe I'm more consensual to friends using my uh, data than I am a stranger, maybe I'm you know more willing to give it to someone with accessibility needs rather than someone without things like that. A uh, quick overview of the survey. Um, we sort of familiarized people with AR in case they didn't know what it was. Now we showed them 11 generic AR activities based on a little sense and technologies um, we found in the loop review. Um, we presented it in a very neutral way, right? We weren't saying, look at this potential for harm. We were just saying, here's a thing that can do it. Um, and then we left it up to their imagination to sort of decide whether it was concerning or not. And all of them had sort of like a picture and some text of video. Um, you can see some of them here. Uh, video playing, kind of, yeah. Um, we don't need to watch the video, but you can get the sense of the, the different kinds of things we're giving. Just some of them are giving little graphics, right? That one's looking at uh, understanding physiological state. You can see the, the 11 ones here. Um, the main thing is just to say, hey, look, there's a, a big range of these, um, all doing lots of different things. Uh, there's the capture one. Kind of, you, you get the idea of what's going on there. Um, in terms of what we asked people, having done that, we were looking at prior awareness, right? Do you know AR can be used for this? Um, to what extent they were going to be concerned about that? Uh, their attitudes towards consent, right? So would they, by default, opt into being part of that activity, or would they want to opt out? And, and for who, right? Maybe they're willing to opt in for friends, but not for strangers. Maybe they're willing to opt in if it's an accessibility need, and, and, someone, uh, and then opt out for someone who's not. Um, and then thinking as well about that desired awareness, right? You know, what level of information do you want to know about what people are doing uh, with your AR device? Um, and to that, again, we're, we're approaching this from the perspective of, okay, if I've got an AR headset on and I'm a bystander to you and you've got one on and you're using my information in some way, maybe we can do more than just a little LED, which is the current uh, standard of things. Maybe we can have a little icon here or we can have, you know, full visibility. Um, less interested in what the, the, the UX of that all looks like, more just the, should it be more informative than the LED? Um, uh, the answer is yes, like people want more information than possible. Which maybe that's not surprising, but you know, it's, it's good to, to motivate future work and to, you know, what does that more information look like? In terms of the survey itself, 102 respondents, uh, most from a UK or uh, US background, um, Rather useful, though, very high levels of prior AR knowledge, right? So these are people who used headsets they, or uh, any sort of smartphone in some capacity. We had a good understanding of you know, what AR is, what its main goals are, um, and we sort of knew what an AR headset was. Um, despite that, though, um, their awareness of its capabilities was rather mixed. Um, a good understanding that it's got a camera and a mic, and then that it can do some basic processing, so it can augment your appearance, or it can do some sort of biometric things. Um, but then maybe less appreciation for some of the more complicated things, right? Things like diminished reality or internal state, physiological state monitoring. Um, but only about half were somewhat aware of that. Um, I think that's quite interesting because, again, when you think about, you know, if an XR headset was to come out or an AR one was to come out, um, the press would get a hold of it. They would write up certainly a list of look at all these things it can do, and then potentially you have you know fifty percent of people saying, "Wow, I didn't know that." Um, and then you can think about maybe what the implications of that are, because uh, again, maybe people are very rejecting of that. In terms of where consent is provided, this is a mess of a slide, um, but uh, just a point at some random things. You know, we saw differences across activity type. So you know, biometric ID as an activity type is different than. Uh, diminished reality as an activity type. So it was on a per activity basis. Um, 
social relationship have some influence as well, right? As you might expect, you know, people more willing to be augmented in their appearance by a friend versus a stranger. Um, also interesting is the amount of yellow. Uh, yellow means I would not actively consent to this if I had the choice at all. Um, I think it's quite interesting because it's across all of them. Uh, maybe you see the similar things and just ask, you know, with a smartphone, are you going to get your picture taken without your consent by a stranger? But again, when I think of it in the perspective of, you know, this device is released and people get this idea that, hey, it can do all of these things. Um, and maybe it's opting in by default on a lot of them. Um, you know, there's questions there whether if the response might be. Um, you can argue things like GDPR maybe should opt you out by default, but, you know, um, I think people are adhering to that all the time anyway. Um, yeah, as I said before, you know, people are looking for more uh, level of awareness of these activities, right? The, the LED doesn't cut it when there's the capability of getting more. Um, you know, half the people did our survey where they're more or less comfortable with the idea of the everyday AR. Uh, they were less comfortable, um, which makes sense, I think, once you've been exposed to some of these harms. Um, and again, it's from that mindset of, you know, okay, once you start educating people about this, are they scared? I mean, maybe, maybe that's the answer. Um, and then in terms of a quick summary of that, you know, consumers are very unaware of the potential harms of everyday AR. Maybe that's to be expected to the extent, right? This isn't a tech they're working with all the time, but you do see that sort of reflection having you know, learned about it, that maybe they're a bit hesitant or skeptical of it. Um, and again, I think of it in terms of, you know, if this gets out into the market, you have people with this massive list of harms, uh, be it journalists or what have you. Um, some sort of online social media mob. Um, do we have good responses for why it can do some of this more invasive things? And when I look at the sort of mitigation strategies, I don't think we really do. I think, you know, in part, it's just a sort of shrug of the shoulders um, to say, you know, we can figure it out, it'll be fine. And, you know, maybe that's not the best approach. Maybe we push for a bit more, uh, you know, concretizing of what these actual strategies and justifications for why it can do a lot of this stuff are. Um, where do we go from there? Because that's uh, that's one thing you can do. Um, one approach, you go deep on one of the harms. So that's what Joey was doing over the summer. Um, I will give her talk again. She already gave it. Um, but she was picking the, what is the potential harm of augmenting your appearance in some way and sort of just looking at that in detail. And again, we see a lot of discussion of how do we prevent this without too strictly limiting it right there's that trade-off of you know you don't want too much control but you don't want too little as well because there's there's a tension there which is very interesting but what i'm interested in um is thinking less about the individual right so all the ones we were thinking about before it's very much you know i'm sensing an individual and i'm acting on that in some way um but what other possible harm is to um and i think it's important to remember when we use technology there's a world surrounding the the user that the tech interacts with and with things like AR, I think we've already got evidence of mistakes where that's been overlooked in the past. Um, and we'll start by talking a bit about Pokemon Go and the real world location examples. Um, there's many accounts in Pokemon Go of people following the digital breadcrumb uh, literally into harm's way. Uh, so some people have wandered onto railroad tracks, uh, the people over here fell off a cliff. Um, some people here wandered into restricted areas of hospitals or other restricted areas, maybe a power plant. Uh, there's a Pokemon Go death tracker of uh, deaths caused by people playing the game, although many of the deaths are people playing it while driving. Um, but certainly a lot of the injuries are people just wandering somewhere where they shouldn't go, be it too close to a cliff, uh, onto a railroad track or into a bad neighborhood. Um, so that's one way in which the, the sort of the AR app hasn't been really aware of uh, the real world user's location. Um, and there's some interesting examples there. Um, maybe the user should be more aware to what extent the game should you know, push back a little. Um, also interesting, I think, is a lack of sort of social location awareness. Uh, so when the game first came out, there was reports of people catching Pokemon at Auschwitz, the concentration camp uh, at the Ground Zero Memorial in New York and other uh, Holocaust Memorial Museums. And again, that's not intentional on the developer's part. It's just the, the algorithms looking for where people are and saying, okay, we should put Pokemon there, there, or there. And then eventually they go in and patch it. They delineate little areas as don't put anything here. Um, 
interesting as well. I think there was the, the user side of it, where there was reports of players luring Pokemon towards, uh, I think it was one of the Holocaust museums near a concentration camp, because they were bored waiting in line for tickets. So they were wanting to play the game when they were losing, uh, luring these things over. Um, and again, there's a level of, you know, at least in terms of the people who run the museum, they felt disrespect there towards the, the nature of the subject matter. Um, you could argue there's a loss in humanity there if you want to catch Pokemon while, wait, wait, while waiting in line uh, to get into one of those museums. But I think it's interesting as well because it's not even the first time that Pokemon Go's developer Niantic has made this exact same mistake. Uh, so we're going to do a history lesson here. We're going to jump back to the game they released before Pokemon Go, which was called Ingress. And Ingress is geocaching and each captured the flag. Uh, the way you play it, when you sign up, you join a rival faction. And you're competing for ownership of physical space. Um, so you've got a map here. On each of these maps are sort of portals. And then you go to one of these. And then you'll play like a real world AR mini game. And then you'll take over a specific part of a location on a map. And then, you know, depending on your faction, you're fighting for space. Um, so one could be, you know, over in the boy door. I could physically go to the boy door and I take it over. And then I've marked that for that faction. Um, and some players, as a quick aside, went crazy about that. Um, in rural communities, there was a report of one person. He found the most remote uh, point to take over that he could in the middle of a field. And then he built fences and holes and physical traps to stop people getting to the spot um, to try and, you know, he was trying to try and take it over. Um, in cities, there's multiple reports of players stalking other players. So if somebody notices that, you know, someone's clearly following the road here, taking these off, um, it's been known that people will enable sort of pincher maneuvers. So someone will chase them on the rival faction, and another person will try and cut them off from the front, and then they'll try and intimidate them if they're not playing the game. Um, and there's a big user element there into, you know, why people are doing that. Um, but to bring it back to the, the concentration camp example, uh, when the game first launched, there was multiple reports of people battling for control of real world locations, including Auschwitz and other concentration camps. Um, and if we're thinking about it in terms of, you know, it being a new year and those who are condemned, uh, those who fail to remember the past are condemned to repeat it, you know, what did they really learn if their next game had the exact same mistake in it? Um, this lack of sort of social. Um, so I'm going to close by talking about some of the ongoing projects that I have in that space. Um, this is just things I've got in level four or five and uh, some master students over the summer to play around with um, while I've been learning a bit about it. And all of these are themed on the topic of uh, protest AR or AR graffiti. And what are some of the social and ethical considerations there? Right? What right do I have to digitally vandalize a church or a business or a house or the Statue of Liberty, et cetera? Um, you know, cultural land points, natural land points. Um, a lot of it's framed from the perspective of protest they are. Uh, there was some literature on that about 10 years ago. I think we agree that in terms of protesting, it's been a wild 10 years since then. Um, and then we can think as well a bit about, you know, how do we prevent this on a location? Uh, how do we mitigate against some of these location-based augmentations? Um, so in terms of exploring harms, one of my students was looking at simulating this idea in AR and um, in VR. So they set up some 360-degree VR scenes of different uh, locations of interest, um, things like churches, cultural land points, uh, the city center, etc. And then they had people place VR graffiti, uh, AR graffiti everywhere. Um, it was a good first prototype, but this is the downsides of being a master student project in that they didn't listen when I explained how to design an experiment, and it was a bit all over the place. Um, but a good proof of concept and something I'd like to try and get back to this year. Um, in terms of mitigation, we might think of a return to the tangible. Uh, so quick aside, at Kai last year in 2023, uh, I met and spoke with Hiroshi Ishii because he was wandering around the demonstrations tables taking pictures of anybody who had a tangible demo. Um, and as I noticed him doing this, he was looking for the best lighting with a girl who had a very interesting tangible demo. And in the process of doing that, as they were wandering around like that, they completely wiped out the demonstration table next to them. Uh, and pretty much destroyed the demo. Um, so I ran over and I was helping them put you know, all the stuff on the table because the person who was manning the station uh, was away getting coffee. And Hiroshi Ishii's plan was just put everything on the table and run. Um, 
So as we were running the scene of the crime, um, I asked him what he thought about Kai that year. And his exact quote was, I feel there's too much virtual and not enough tangible today. Uh, so I said, okay, I will do a tangible AR study in the honor of Hiroshi Ishii um, of MIT Tangibles fame. Um, and the, the best idea I've had so far, uh, which one of my students is playing around with, is what if you bring back the, the, the need to actually touch things when you have to place your AR graffiti? Um, so maybe you can do the design on your phone, but then if you want to put it on that wall of it, you physically have to go in and tap it with your phone to place it in AR. Um, because if you do that, you get the return of the physical deterrent, right? Fences work again. Height works again. You need a ladder, things like that. Um, it also just feels really cool because one of my students is a demo of it working. Um, and it's just something satisfying about you know, drawing something on a wall and then just tapping it into existence rather than just you know pushing a button, which is a bit lame. Um, so we'll see how they get on with that. Uh, and then finally, a lot of them are dealing with the problem of how do we manage usability of uh, content or how that should be managed. Because in real life, you know, if there's a poster on a wall and I want to put something there, I can tear it down and put up my own or I can just paste it over it. Um, but with AR, a lot of them find, you know, we have an extra dimension theoretically um, where we can layer the posters or we can put them in parallel somehow. Um, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a voting system to determine based on my preferences which is the best poster for me to see at any given time. Um, and, you know, people have their own ideas on that. I just think that's an interesting UX problem, uh, which, again, is something they all encounter. They all decide on a solution, but there probably needs to be something to, to figure out what the exact approach to that is. So that's just some of the examples of uh, some things that have been going on that I hope to try and finish off this year and maybe do some variations of, uh, etc. How do I end this talk? Because I've covered a lot, perhaps too much, perhaps too quickly, um, for the other time. Uh, the boring ending is to say that we need community consensus and discussion. Um, I think the harm is obvious. Again, you know, if we give these things to enough people and eventually we get that massive list of concerns. Um, and then it's a question of do we have good answers and justifications for all the potential harm it's doing? Um, you know, is there this idea of a core set of expectations and rights that people need? Um, I don't think we have that, but you know, you could argue that maybe we do, but you know, who knows. Um, and again, I would argue that we need this sort of idea of expectations before we get to the point of massive is you know, if we don't get there, again, I think we get that backlash of you know social norms uh, being rejecting the technology. Um, and generally I just want people to discuss this, even if it's to call me crazy and say it's not a problem. Um, I'll take that. Um, uh, now for the strange ending, because I think that would be nice and fun for the, the end of the year. Um, so to contextualize this, uh, Mark and I wrote an essay for Mum, and we published it as a short paper. And I gave the talk, and I quipped, I quipped at the start of it that we're bringing the HCI essay back. And uh, a German professor, after the talk, um, I won't say who, came up to me and said, good talk, good essay, but I don't think you can bring the HCI essay back. Uh, and I thought, challenge accepted. Um, and then I struggled to think of a good idea for a follow-up essay. Um, and I was reading a lot of surrealist Japanese literature over Christmas, as one does uh, in the season. And I had an idea for something. It might be an alt I talk. I don't know yet. Uh, but it's entitled... Uh, it, move? it is entitled wait for it, Sticks and Ropes and Extended Reality, uh, which is based on uh, two short stories and a play by the Japanese author uh, Kobo Abe. Uh, one is entitled The Rope, one is entitled The Stick, and the other is entitled The Man Who Turned Into The Stick. Um, and a quick uh, run through of the quote, uh, you know, in the, the rope, Kobo Abe argues that the rope and the stick are the oldest tools, uh, one is for keeping evil away, uh, the other tool he invented first was for pulling the good towards. Um, these are the first tools, and wherever you find people, these tools always exist. Uh, and then the other is a reflection on the nature of tools in general. Uh, once a human being grabs something, there's no telling what it can do. Once we equip a tool, you know, there's no saying that a rope needs to always be a rope. Um, so I've written the end of the talk, because I can't remember this from memory, because uh, I wrote it the other night. Um, so I'll just read it, because it's a strange ending. Uh, I think it's wrong first. So, uh, Kobo Abe's works are, in short, a reflection on humanity on tools. There are about many more things than I have time to talk about today, so I will try and cut to the point on what I find relevant to us as HCI designers, as creators of tools. 
Uh, Jacobo Abe, the stick and the tool form the basis of our culture and civilization. There's some precedent of this, given the definition of human history by our tools, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Information Age. To be a human is to be a user of tools. Wherever you find humans, the rope and the stick also exist. But to Kobo Abe, it is something more than this. It is our ability to reflect on these tools, to understand that the rope can be used as a stick that makes us as humans unique. And it is in this reflection that things start to blur, where humans start to become the tool rather than merely its user. Again, there's precedent for this. Many surnames were originally based on occupations, and rightly or wrongly, how much of our own identity and perceived value is caught up in how we think of our own professions and the value we produce. To Kobuabe taken to the extreme, this blurring of the user and the tool represents a loss in humanity, be it from the technology or the tool itself, uh, what we become as users of tools, and the systems we create surrounding tools. And I suppose in this, it is ultimately where the harms I've spoken about today and others come from. It is our ability to look at a rope and see its use as a stick, our ability to imagine the knife which cuts the rope and then see its own use as a stick. As we soon enter the augmented or artificial age, call it what we will, what should we then reflect on? What is lost is the line between user and tool blurs evermore. Is it this loss in humanity that motivates us to covertly record a person, to augment a person without their consent, to digitally vandalize a church, or to catch a Pokemon in a concentration camp? Uh, I began today with the adage that those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it, but it is said also that history repeats itself, and wherever you find humans, the rope and the stick also exist. Uh, so with that, I will end the talk, depending on how good or bad it was. Um, Donald Knuth runs an annual Christmas talk. I think it would be funny to start my own New Year talk. Um, I think it's beneficial for everyone to think about their prior work and uh, what they should want to do in the coming year. So I find it's very useful to write this talk. Um, and with that, I will take questions, hopefully not about surreal Japanese literature. Yes, Alexander. This is sounds like Yeah, I think that that's a that's a good point. Uh, there, there's a lot lost in the very playful nature of the tech and how it's presented, especially meta. You know, when you see their uh, meta uh, quest three, it's presented from the perspective of here's a bunch of games. Um, maybe you'll get some productivity things. You can argue over the, whether people want to put these things on as a new workspace. Um, I've seen a lot of examples, especially at Kai a couple of years ago, of uh, AR to help people see. Right, so this idea that you know. You're wearing a headset, it can describe people as they come towards you in the street if you've got low vision. Um, so it'll say, you know, someone's approaching you, they're approaching you this quickly. Um, you know, maybe it'll try and infer some extra things. It'll try and infer, okay, if we think this is a female, we think this is a male. Um, so there's certainly a lot of practical use there in terms of you know, assisting people with uh, real world needs, things like that. Um, um, and one of, the, one, one of those studies which I saw was looking at unassisted for the blind, they did the, you know, does it feel different to, or would you let somebody who's not augmented, uh, sorry, someone without an accessibility need, uh, read the same level of information about you, right? Like, would you let it assume your gender or your, your distance, et cetera? Um, and they found differences on that social level. Uh, so that's one use case. Um, I have lots, but that's what I like a lot. Uh, anyone else, Steve? Yeah, you the kind of compelling arguments that you gave about the part are there any interest in the company? Do they, do they buy into these harms? Do they try to do anything? Sort of, or are they just like pushing forward and down? Oh, you, again, you, you see with that. Meta certainly argue for privacy by design. Now, whether they mean it or not is one thing, right? Because again, I think the argument that. Are they, are they enabling that? Are they in enabling? Their, in their in Quest 3 in any way? It's a good question. Um, I think they certainly have a more conscious outlook compared to Google when they released Google Glass, right? So that seemed like very, what I remember certainly feel like a very good shrug of, you know, we'll figure it out, it's fine. Um, there seems to be at least some recognition. I think Apple are the same. They seem to at least acknowledge that these, these are harmful. Um, 
and had to certainly lock a lot of the developer settings around or the pass through content, you know, behind dev walls, right? If you try to record via the pass through view, you just see a black screen. So you have to then figure out some way of working around that. Um, so they are conscious in some ways, I think. Um, maybe not as much as they should be. No. Okay, that, that is on the list. Second one is I was it's not a question, it's more like a thing that kept me in mind throughout the book. There are a lot of things about the kind of the harm or even just like the kind of the usability issue yeah. when everyone's seeing a different version of the world. Mm -hmm. How do they how does the platform or the person or other people decide or regulate or inform what's seen? And I just kept thinking about the social media landscape, if you take a proactive uh, step in curating your own social media yeah. to make sure it doesn't show you horrific garbage yeah. the whole time. Like my Twitter is only games I like and cute animals. Mm -hmm. like, something political has to be really bad to get there. It has to permeate through several layers. So I just that, that, that was that was the thing that kept coming to my mind is everyone walking around kind of seeing their own kind of the content that they subscribe to, I guess, yeah. placed by kind of fellow community members yeah. or even just generated. And yeah. it's kind of a nice way to kind of get a feel of how many people around you do or have no interest in the things you're interested in. in. In the same way that I can tell, depending on where I am, if anyone around me plays Pokemon Go or, yeah. or Pick and Bloom by yeah. whether or not there's any activity or it's just me and there's, not, there's nothing else in sight. Yeah. I think that's interesting as well because it raises questions or because you never said, you know, you've got your own preference for what you want to see. And you know, the censorship example of you just block out people of a particular race or gender, etc. Like, there are some people who would want that. And it's to the extent of, well, to what extent do you allow that? Um, you could, like you say, just have you know, the, the sort of innocent harms where all you see is really positive things. Um, and then there's the question of what does that do to your, your sort of psyche if you, you only ever see things that you agree with on some level, right? You never see the kind of viewpoint, you never see the, the negativity. Um, and maybe you need a balance. Um, yeah. It's not really a, an XR problem, though. That's a social media. Yeah, just now exactly. placed into your environment. Yeah, it's, 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 may, it may be more powerful or not. In the same way that I never listen to what the real world is wanting me to listen to, or I listen to what I want the real world to sound like all the time. Like my headphone time on is like you know yeah. must, must be like ninety percent. Yeah. yeah, that's that's one of the interesting things I don't know, <laughs> but I'm concerned a bit. <laughs> So, a um, uh, very nice talk, first of all. Um, I think the, the uh, is it the comment about the, uh, like, applications that are productive or applications that are for entertainment. Uh, it's interesting that it's always the, the entertainment applications are the, that are the ones that hold a lot of benefit for physical harm to others. So, for example, uh, you know, the camera, for example, of my phone. Yeah, of course, I use it for also do some important things, but most of the time it's used for you know, yeah. it's actually something that could be used for more hard compared to how the text editor, for example, is something that is that's productive. So uh, but but also when I think of of, uh, of for example when you put the 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 Pokemon Go and, and the things that you could encounter when uh, playing it, um people also injure themselves for example in uh, games in real life, right? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, like, do people approach those games or those things in the real world that have a potential to harm, to harm this, like, the way that we can learn from to apply in, in, in AR gaming, for example, or, uh, so for example, like, do people, are people, for example, bothered about building fences and so, probably they are, but, but I mean, people, people are not like, for example, um, what I'm trying to say is that I feel like in AR, we sort of have this good idea, we have this technology there, or we have uh, not just AR, basically any technology that could be used to create something, an experience, and so then we, we feel a bigger responsibility to protect uh, people who are using it for potential misuse of them compared to the real world. Um, do you agree with this, or do you see that, uh, that, that there are things that we can do to calculate time? I think it's interesting what you're saying 
to the, the analogy to games, right? The game of football, it always takes place on a pitch. There are rules designed to protect players. You know, they, they have to wear certain equipment to try and prevent harm. Um, I think, you know, the analogy there is, you know, we'll, we'll, what, what are we doing to try and protect that as a, a digital standpoint? Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, but I, I, another question, like, of course, for, for Pokemon Go, for example, so the RPG is still in work in 2016, but it's still being used on the yeah. day. Um, so how has it developed? Like, how did it develop at all? Did yeah, so they, yeah, so, so for like the Auschwitz ones where they went in and they put, like, okay, we draw a fence around these areas and then you don't put any Pokemon there, right? And then, like, you know, you know, yeah, like a virtual, like a virtual fence, essentially, right? You know, if you're looking at the map. So it's sort of responsive. Yeah, they were doing it in a more responsive way. Now, maybe they had some setup initially and you know, some gaps slipped through, right? And then it's a question of just curating the, okay, don't put anything here, don't put anything here, don't put anything here. Um, there's now all the dynamism there, right? You can imagine, you know, you don't want people to wander into, you know, a harmful area and maybe it wasn't harmful at the start. So you figure out, okay, in this time, maybe there's a protest on. There's going to be a lot of foot traffic there. Maybe we can redirect people with the Pokemon a different way. Um, so you can lure them away. Um, so you can make it dynamic in that way. Uh, which is quite interesting. So, no more questions. Uh, we've gained seven minutes of our lives back. It's good. Uh, Thanks, <laughs>